My name is Kenzie Thorpe, your host, and this is Show Me Rutten Podcast. On this episode, I sit down with Eddie Roberts of Dead Ringer and share my story of my Friday evening public hunt. Episode 4 of Show Me Rutten Podcast. This past weekend was another good weekend. Got out to the woods and uh, had a pretty memorable hunt Friday evening. I was hunting one of the public lands here in Columbia and I was planning on going to an area that I hadn't scouted before. Did aerial photos, maps to see, you know, what I thought would be a good spot. So I start out. I park, I get ready, and I start walking in. There's a path. So I follow this path, and I can see it on the maps, the aerial maps that I use on my phones. And I'm following it, and it leads right to the area that I wanted to go. By the time I got to where I had first thought I wanted to go, it was a lot farther than I th- I had imagined because the the path was very windy. It wasn't very straight because it followed the the high ridge of these hills of these strip pits, I got to where I wanted to go and it really wasn't what I thought it was going to be, what I thought it looked like from the aerial photos, so I kept walking. And I just kept walking and walking and I never really could find a spot that I thought, you know, this is where I want to be. So I turn around and I I head back towards the truck and in my mind I'm like, I'm going to find a tree, I'm going to sit in it, and I'm going to see what happens because you never know. And if I don't find a tree that I can climb, I'm just going back to the truck and I'm going home, and I'll hang out with the missus and the little one. Well, I'm making my way back, and I cut into the timber at this area where it seems like it's pretty open, and there's a pond down there, and I find a few trees, and I climb one. And, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about the area that I have fell into, kind of, because earlier from what I've seen, it really wasn't what I thought it was going to be, but this seemed to be okay. There was kind of a crevice that was going down to the pond, and I'm sitting on the pond, and I felt pretty good. but. Ending up, all I saw was a groundhog and a few squirrels. So I then, you decide, I'm going to pack up, head on back to the truck, take the trek back. So this hunt that I had, you know, pretty good hopes for because, you know, doing overview, scouting, and talking to Poe, we had thought this area might be a good area because of the private land that was off to the north. Well, the only sign of deer that I saw was when I was walking out. I happened to get a glimpse of a, I believe it was a doe, it was a young deer as I was walking down the path out. So this hunt wasn't, you know, the most successful, but I did learn one key thing from that hunt, and that is get your boots on the ground before you hunt anywhere. Because as much as the aerial maps are nice these days, it really doesn't give you that visual and seeing it up close and personal as putting your boots on the ground and getting out there so that's the one thing i took from that hunt and the fact you know it is good cardio saturday hunted in the morning saw a few does nothing with horns saturday evening poe and i went out we hunted a stand that's on the south end of a timber we call the east timber and uh, we had pretty good hopes about that stand it was a little warm but we knew that we'd be able to see a lot of area And we were hoping to use it as an observation sit to see what was going on. Well, yeah, that that plan didn't work out either. We didn't see a deer. And uh, it was frustrating. But at the same time, you know, we got in the stand. The stand set up was working. It wasn't perfect. It needs a little adjustments. But it worked. Before it got dark, we're like, let's go check this camera that we hadn't checked in probably a few weeks. So we went over, we checked that camera, and we had it out. And, you know, we're walking probably 800 to 1,000 yards in one direction. So in total, 2,000 yards. And this is some thick, thick stuff because we're hunting on public. And we just, we get back to the truck and we're just frustrated because we didn't even bump a deer on the way out. 
you know, walk into the truck. And that's very rare for this area that we hunt. And we're like, what's going on? You know, like, what are we doing? And we knew that we had that game camera that we checked. And I told him, let's take a look at that. Let me get back. Let me get back to Columbia and I'll take a look at the photos that are on the game camera. Let's see what's going on. Let's see if we even want to hunt this area anymore. So, you know, I make my way back to Columbia that night. Sunday, I pull out the computer and I pull out the game camera card and I start looking and I'm like, there's a lot of bucks on here. You know, they're they're young bucks. There's a one old one, I believe, but there's some young bucks and they're nice bucks. They're not, you know, world record breakers, but they're nice bucks, especially for us. And we're, I'm like, what's going on? I mean, because this is literally, this camera was in the same timber we were hunting, just on the other end of it. So we're like, what? We got to rethink what we're doing. And and that's one of the things that we do throughout the year is that we always try to continually update not only stand locations, but, you know, we always have game cameras out to be able to see where those deer are moving, how they're moving, what time of day they're moving. And that's one of the things I looked at on these photos was when were the bucks crossing this camera and what direction were they going? So maybe we can get an idea of what they're doing, where they're bedding and where they're going. And it was crazy because the bucks seemed to be always heading east, no matter if it was morning, night, middle of the day, middle of the night. It didn't matter. They were heading east. And I'm like, what is going on? Why is that? And right now I am at the point where I really don't know why. I don't know. And I don't know if it's because they just wander because it's so thick back there. Or is there a bedding area in two locations where maybe they move back and forth? They head this direction when they head east, and when they come back west, it's another whole trail. I don't know. And that's what we've got to figure out. And we've got to try to get up and figure them out, get in between them and their bedding and their feeding, and get us a, an opportunity to harvest a mature buck. So this weekend was a good weekend. Um, I learned a lot. I learned that you need to make sure to scout not only aerial photos and maps, but get your feet on the ground in the areas that you want to hunt, especially if you don't know the area. And always, always keep putting time and investing time in scouting because throughout the year, deer are going to change depending on what happens. Harvest time, after harvest time, weather breaks, cold fronts come through, snow, this type of stuff, rut you know, they're always going to change their paths. And you always got to, if you want the best opportunity, you need to keep your scouting efforts up and make sure that you're staying up with how the deer are moving. So that is what we had done for the last weekend. That's our update. And uh, here's the interview I did with Eddie Roberts. Appreciate him a lot for taking the time to do this. Great guy, great interview. And here you go. This week on Show Me Rutten Podcast, we got Eddie Roberts with Dead Ringer. How are you, sir? Very well, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being on here. We really appreciate it. So for the people out there that are listening, who is Eddie Roberts and you know what's your background? I know you're a big hunter, so what, what's the background? Who's Eddie? Well, Eddie Roberts, he's a national pro staff director for uh, Dead Ringer Hunting. The company's located out of Rochester, New York. I'm on multiple pro staffs. I'm the Northeast Regional Director for uh, Sun Crusher. I'm on a pro staff for jabs, chokes, Mill Creek Valley game calls, heavy shot ammo. I mean, the list just goes on. I started out at a very young age when I was uh, hunting. I started actually in my 20s, and uh, I started out pheasant hunting. I worked in a law firm in the city. I was born and raised in the city. A buddy of mine said, hey, Eddie, you want to do some hunting? I said, sure, why not? I'll give it a shot. So we went out, we went to a pheasant preserve, and back then, oh, I say in the early 80s, you know, my dad, you know, he was in the construction business like I am, local seven tile finisher. It was hard times back then, so they had to draw out all their annuity money. So what they did was he took his, he took a thousand bucks and said, here you go, son, do what you want with it. So guess what Eddie does? He goes out and buys a Remington 1100 shotgun. Heck so yeah. I, yeah, so I bought a shotgun, and I got into bird hunting. I bought a bird dog, and and then I got married in 86, 87, and then my father said, did you ever shoot a deer? I said, no. We had, he had property up in PA, 
It was nice. He goes, well, you sit right here and you can, you'll kill a deer. He gave me a 243 and, and it just took off from there, man. I mean, I just love to hunt. I love bow hunting. Bow hunting is my passion. I like the rifle, the muzzle loader I like also, but bow hunting is where it's at. Now, turkey hunting, we were at that place in PA and the deer season was over and I said to my brother, I said, hey, bud, what do we, uh, why don't we go try to kill some birds in the spring? There's so many of them. Then from there, I just took took over. Yeah. And I just love turkey. Turkey hunting is my passion. That's what I do. Uh, I love taking people out, taking young kids out, my family, my friends, guys who never killed a bird before. It's just, it's awesome. I'm in championship, calling championships. Uh, I do it all. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, talking about turkey hunting, you know, that's, you know, that's a big part of what we do, too, and what I do. I love turkey hunting. It's probably second to, you know, bow hunting for whitetail. But right. it, it, it is a sport for sure. And I like how you may not set yourself up right early but you can always you know try to find another one it's not over after that first set exactly see here here in new york you know we're only allowed to hunt to 12 o'clock yeah missouri it's one so we're about the same yep, so i told you know i tell these people if you don't get one in the morning from 10 to 12 those birds are going to leave those hands and they're going to look for looking so for number what, two that's it yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. there's always that second round and it's crazy, but I, I got a lot of game cameras out, and I get birds around my game cameras around noon. It just very yeah. regularly hit my game cameras around noon. Yeah, it's nice, though. I mean, I really, really enjoy it. I mean, I just, like I said, I love taking the kids out, you know, youth hunters and just people, disabled vets I do. I do hunts for them, and well, that's what Eddie usually does. I'm a tile finisher in Local 7 out of New York City. I travel every day to New York. I'm about two hours away from the city. So I'm up pretty early and I get home pretty late. Yeah, but that's about it, really. I mean, that's that's Eddie Rops. I do a lot of a lot of shows. I do I do a lot of consumer shows. I do the Harrisburg show, and I travel a lot. I do a lot of hunts. You know, I, I travel all over the place. Killed my first mule deer in New Mexico, and that was back in January. I killed a beautiful bear in New Brunswick last uh, this past May, not this May, but the year before. Mm-hmm. It was just got it on film. And, you know, I just started out, you know, just hunting, and I just fell in love with it, and that's my passion, and I just took it from there, and I took it to the next level. I got on these pro staff teams, and it just kept accelerating. Now I'm on a television show called The Hitman Television with Wayne Anthony. Yep. He was up to camp with us, and, you know, I got to liking him, he got to liking me, and we just clicked it and hit it off. So, you know, you talked about Dead Ringer, and I introduced you as Dead Ringer. That's kind of how we met. Is through Correct. Dead Ringer, and um, I'm on the pro staff. So, when did you become director of the pro staff for Dead Ringer? It was about two years ago. I took over about two years ago, and it's been climbing ever since. I have about 140 staff members now. I have five managers that are, that are, that are underneath me. You know, we're all broken up to northwest, southwest, midwest, northeast, and southeast. And these, you know, you know, there's applications online where you can apply and join. There is a fee, but like I said, there's a lot of how you say uh, benefits. initiatives, benefits, initiatives. What you can do, discounts. Yeah. You get, you know, it's, it's really good. Yep. Really no, good. I totally, I can, I can vouch for that, and as I have uh, been a part of those discounts. You talk about youth and you talk about veterans. Um, Big Muddy is the company that I have. It's a brand. It's a team of mine. And, you know, we, we that one of our main goals is why I started Big Muddy is to pass along that passion that you talk about, that passion for not only bow hunting but hunting in general, and to pass it on to the youth. It sounds like you're doing the same thing by taking these kids out and, and teaching them the right way to hunt and the most ethical way to hunt. And, you know, it's funny, Kenzie, you say that because when I when I take these young kids out, you know, here in New York, you got from 12 to 15 is the youth the youth weekend. It's always mm-hmm. the week before our season. Just, well, like you guys down in Missouri. Yep. And when they hear them birds gobbling and they just <laughs> see those birds coming in and I got them in the blind, I got the cameras rolling and their face just lights up, man. And oh. it kind of hits you in your heart a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. It's happy. Yeah. Happy for them that they're enjoying the experience. And I always tell, hey, 
like the father or, or a single father, single mother or whatever, or whatever, an uncle, aunt, they want to join along, I'm more than happy to take them. Yep. I mean, yeah. and I have – I outfit them the best I can, you know. If they didn't have, a, they don't have a shotgun or something. I have twenty gauges with the beard bust on it, and Jeb's chokes and the heavy shot twenty gauge, and it's all patterned for them. All they gotta do is pull the trigger, and just to see their face, man, that's oh. that's what it's all about. And like you said, hearing those gobbles in the morning. I mean, when it's pitch black still, and you hear that first gobble, it's. I mean, it, every time it's like it's the first time. It doesn't yeah. matter if you've hunted for fifteen or years or a year. It's like a year. No it's matter. awesome. That that gobble is amazing. Yep, I just I enjoy it every time, and I do a lot of hard scouting. Even I know my properties, I still do a lot of hard scouting. I like patterning these birds before you know you were just to go out and call and try to set up them. I want to see it's just like a big buck. You just mm-hmm. want to see where they're going. Yeah, you want to see, see them roost. Yeah, just see where they roost. Get them on at night. You hoot to them, you know, and yeah. they gobble, and boom, okay, you try to get in on them in the morning. Yeah. And, you know, you might think I'm crazy, but I get in there like 45 minutes before. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got to. You got to because they're, they're, they're only sense is eyesight, so. That's correct. That's their here defense. Here yep, oh. they're here. Awesome, too. So. Um, you talk about scouting. What are some techniques? What are some, you know, tools that you use to scout turkey? Well, basically, I do a lot of glassing. Like in the winter time, I'm talking February and March, where they're all they're all flocked together. I mean, you can have 30, 40 long beards. The hens, the the poults from last year are turning into jakes. The two year olds. That's what I do on my scouting. You see how many birds are on my properties. Now, what happens is as you get closer to the season, like Abel, they start dispersing. They start going to other sections of the farm, or they'll go across the road. They'll go to the neighboring farm. They all just don't stay there. What I like to do is when I get the property, when I scout, I try to look for for cows, you know, like a, a farm that has a dairy farm. Because, you know, these birds, they like picking through that manure, and they like getting the bugs and then the grasshoppers and the open fields and the clover. That's what I look for in New York. Uh, when I scout, what I basically do is I, I, I hoot in the morning. I see where these birds are. I don't educate them. I don't call to them. Because when you call to these birds, they're going to smarten up on you. You know what I mean? If you keep calling to them from the road and they keep hearing that same box call and they keep hearing that same slate call, I mean, you're going to, you educate them, you know? So when they come walking in, they'll say, well, there ain't nothing here. I'm going to turn around and leave. By the time the season comes, they know the game. They're stupid in a way, but they're not. I mean, their brain's only the size of a tape. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. But they get educated. I mean, that's my personal, that's my opinion. That's why I don't do that. I, I'd rather use a locator call, a crow call, or, or an owl call. But basically an owl call, that usually gets them fired up. We will be right back after this short break. Built to Hunt is your one-stop shop for all things hunting and fitness. Your top resource for outdoor supplements, backcountry meals, fitness accessories, training plans, nutritional content, and more. Compare all the best outdoor brands side by side and let Built to Hunt help you bridge the gap from athlete to hunter. One of my buddies, Mike Atterbury, is one of the two owners of Built to Hunt. And if you know him, you know they are only going to have the best. Head on over to Built2Hunt.com. B-U-I-L-T, the number two, H-U-N-T, dot com. And check out what they got and use Code BMO10 and get an additional 10% off your first order. So, we talked a little turkey hunting. I'm going to jump back to Dead Ringer and talk about Dead Ringer and tell us what Dead Ringer offers. What does Dead Ringer bring to the market so people know? what they're okay. looking for when they go to Dead Ringer. All righty. Now, when you come to Dead Ringer Hunting, I mean, it's a it's a small company, first of all. Uh, they've been in business now for seven years. Uh, they come out with gun sights for ventilated rib shotguns. They have the beard buster, the duck buster. They have upland game, waterfowl. Uh, they have all kinds of accessories for bow hunting. We have broadheads. And every year we come out with new broadheads. And just we come out with... Uh, with bow cases, we came out with we came out with new sites this year for for bow sites. Uh, we got together with Wadi and we got together with Travis and and, and Nick, 
and they designed they designed these these uh, bow sights, which are phenomenal. And the price range it's not astronomical. I mean, you get anywhere from forty nine ninety nine up to seventy nine ninety nine. I mean, that's what's nice about that. You don't have to go crazy and spend two or three hundred dollars on a bow sight, you know. And it has a lighted pin on it. You know, we have the wheel, we have the tack driver. What else do we have? We have the tack driver DT. Uh, it's just so many items we have. We have stabilizers. Uh, we have scopes uh, for rifles. What else does that ring have to offer? Definitely the customer service is beyond phenomenal. If anything ever happens to your product or there's something wrong, you just call and send it back. And you will. You will be happy and you will get an answer and you will get new product. No, I you know can I can vouch for that personally because um, I don't know if you remember, but my site, I got the Tag Driver DT the one mm-hmm. you're talking about and right. my the ball inside the screw that moves the sight left and right i screwed it too much on and it popped off and the ball and the spring popped out and i lost that spring and you guys had me a new spring within a week and i mean that's you're talking about a micro spring i mean it's tiny and you right. guys got that to me you know within a week so i definitely can contest to the customer service and you know, like well, like I said, with Dead Ringer hunting, I mean, we sponsor a lot of TV shows now, like on the Sportsman's Channel and the Outdoor Channel. Bone collector guys use, you know, use the sites. So we got the White Tail Freaks. They use our broadheads. Red Rising Television. You know, it's just there's so many people that are coming on board with us because they know how good our broadheads really actually are. And me. I personally love them. I've been shooting them for seven years, not just because I work for the company and I'm their national pro staff director. I've shot in a lot of heads in my entire career of bow hunting. I've been bow hunting for a long time. And these, these heads, they do, they do stand up. And when they say they will be blood, they will be blood. And I've shot a bear, like I said, up in New Brunswick and I, I shot it with the Super Freak Extreme and it didn't even go 30 yards. I shot my mule deer with the, with a switchback. That thing didn't run 40 yards. 56 yards, they fly true. I mean, they're just unbelievable heads, and I stand by that. And our gun sights, I'm telling you, they're unbelievable. That Beard Buster is our number one selling gun sight on the market today. You have to have a ventilated rib. They come five sixteenths, I think three quarters, uh, yeah, three quarters or, or or one eighth. They fit the ventilated ribs. And what happens is it's adjustable. If you're shooting high, you can move it up the rail. You're shooting low, you can move it up the rail, and it adjusts for you. Mm -hmm. It gathers the light in any low light conditions. I mean, just, you know, when it is, as you're hunting those turkeys, those birds, especially those Rios, if you're down in Texas, they always fly down and like just at that crest of light and you can't see them through your, through your iron sights or your scope. Any little hint of light will light up that sight for you. It gathers the light. You know, it's optical electron. It's not fiber optic. Great for youth hunter, youth hunters. I still use it because what happens is it forces you to keep your head down on the stock. And it doesn't, like, you know, a lot of hunters, like I take out, they always tend to peek. You know, they peek over that front barrel, you know, that front sight. Mm-hmm. This forces you to keep your head down. That's the whole key. You're keeping your head down on that, your cheek down on that stock where you can line that. And you put that, that front uh, optical sight right in front on his waddle and you just pull that trigger. And that's all you got to do. We have duck busters. Yeah. What those sites do, I mean, I have the site as well. And what they do, like you said, it helps narrow the line of vision too, because it gives you that circular optical. It allows you to minimize where you're shooting as well. Another thing too, Mackenzie, which it's like, if it's not in the ring or if it's not in that oval duck buster or that drop box, you're not killing them. You're not harvesting your game. It just, they have to be in there. And also with the drop box and that duck buster, you know, for waterfowl hunters, it has a built-in lead. So when that bird's coming from the right and it's flying, you put that on his beak and you just follow it through. You just follow through and it gives you a built-in lead for about 30 yards and vice versa, left to right. Yep. You know, that's that's what's nice about that feature. So, you know, like you said, Dead Ringer brings a lot of accessories, uh, archery style to the market. You, yep. you, you got the broadheads, the sights, the stabilizers, the cases, the slings. Backpacks. Everything, everything you could want. And yep. uh, definitely quality for the price. Like you said, the sites, great price range. I, I mean, I yes. was – the one thing I love about the site, and I'm glad they designed it this way, is because of that spin knob on the site that allows you to move the site without using an Allen wrench or anything like a standard right. site. This is just a turn knob that clicks and lets you know that you're moving it. 
Correct. And, and you know, we also have bow slings too. You know what I mean? I mean, you carry it to your stand. You, hey, you're out west. I used mine out west on my mule deer hunt. You know, you're walking, you're spotting and stalking. You know, it's great to have. You're hands-free. You can use your range finder, use binoculars, yep. whatever. And that's what's nice about it also. Yep. Well, like I said, we have a lot to offer to, to the public and to our customers. And uh, it's just the products that come out, they're really, really worth getting. I mean, that's just my personal opinion. Let's talk. Let's get a little personal here for a second. Uh, sure. Eddie, when season open there for Whitetail? October 1st. October 1st. Are you ready? Next. A- am I ready? Yes. I've been, we, we lease a farm down in, uh, in Orange County, about 200 acres, and uh, I've had my cameras out now. You know, you got to understand, too, around here, we don't get the big bucks like they do in Iowa, in Illinois. You know, it's in Missouri. You know, if we see a 130 class deer and he's three and a half years old, believe me, somebody's going to whack him. Somebody's going to shoot. It's it's like it's hard to, to manage your land here in New York or New Jersey because what happens is you have neighboring farms mm-hmm. and they're, they're going to shoot at them. And look, I don't blame them. I mean, if that's what they want and that's what they feel like they want to shoot at and they're happy with that deer, hey, I'm all for it. You know, but for us, we try to we try to let him grow. You know, we try to say, hey, hopefully he'll make it during gun season. Yeah. You know, and then next year we get pictures. I got tons of trail camera pictures of bucks. You know, like one twenties, one fifteens. You know, which are nice. Yeah. Uh, had a bear on there the other day. That was pretty cool. The little guy, he was that was pretty cool. And we're not allowed to bait. You know, in New York, you cannot bait. You can't use minerals. You can't use anything. So what I usually do is I try to find. You know, our feeding sources are standing cornfield. Mm-hmm. Try to get trails from the bedding area to the feeding. Put the cameras up on heavy use trails, logging roads. That's that's how we, me anyway. That's how I do my scouting and do my preparation for bow season. And you know, I, I've said this. Uh, this is this will be episode number four on this podcast, and I've said it. I think in every episode, and the way you talk is exactly how we want to not only pass on the perception of hunting but understand that to each person the word trophy means something different it could be a spike it could be it could be a three-pointer exactly you know? and that and that's where i, I talked to a guy it was sam the owner of tap and he was saying how social media is kind of destroying it because all yeah. they do is want to post the biggest things and they don't really promote those you know 115s those 130 inch deer because it's not a trophy trophy correct exactly but that's not right you know that's not right whatever you feel whatever you feel that makes you happy i agree if you want to shoot doe and you think that's a trophy hey take them you know what i mean you want to shoot a four pointer that's fine Mm -hmm. i also believe if you never shot a deer before and you're like hey my first buck was a little was a spike with a little point coming out he's a three-pointer Yep. I shot a rifle in PA. I was ecstatic. That was my first buck I ever shot in my entire life. Yep. I thought it was a 180. You know yep. what I mean? <laughs> but it's just what people want to do, and, and I'm all for it. Yep. I really, really am. It doesn't bother me. Me personally, I'll pass those 115, 120s because where I'm at, I try to let them grow. And if somebody gets them, oh, well, if that makes that person happy, I'm all for it. Yep, we're the same way, you know. We try to promote all kills, and that's what we do, all harvest. I mean, we we're we're in the same boat as you, and we're I mean, we're in Missouri, so we see quite a quite a good amount of bucks, nice bucks, you know. For us, 150 is about what's happy for us. That's a shooter for sure. Is a 150, 160. I've never shot anything. I think my biggest is a 150. So anything over that is like woohoo. Right. But, exactly. but you know, like just like you're saying, you know, a 130 down there is the same to us as a 150 here. Correct. You know, it's always funny. A buddy of mine, you know, he makes me laugh. You know, he'll see a trail cam picture, right? He say, "That buck's a 150, Eddie." I go, "No, he's only about a 120." <laughs> I said, so "When you go away with me to an outfit, I make sure you bring your extra cash." <laughs> he laughs. We laugh so hard, yeah. and that's what hunting's all about too. Can you know that? It's all about your friends and your family. Getting together, hanging out. I could care less if I pull back my bow this year. I it doesn't bother me. It really it doesn't. Just to be out there, seeing the sunrise, seeing the sunset, see nature of course, like a pack of coyotes running by, maybe see a bear. You know, that's what it's all about, man. I just it doesn't bother me. It really I just enjoy being out there and, and passing the knowledge that I know to somebody else. 
And I'm going to say this. This has happened almost every podcast, too, is that I don't know. I'm, I'm doubting you've listened to the other episodes, but you guys are saying like the same thing that I said in the first one. My first podcast was an intro into me a little bit, but into the Big Muddy and why we started Big Muddy. And the number one thing was because of memories. We wanted a way to keep those memories because you will remember them, but you won't ever remember them exactly. Right. Because you're human. But if you have that video and that audio of mm-hmm. that moment, you know, when you, you, you like relive it and it just brings you back to that moment and that memory you just relive. And it's just, that's one of the reasons why we did it and why we started Big Muddy. That's cool. That's real cool. Like I said, the three memories that I had were my two boys. You know, one, one was in Virginia. He was just, I don't know, I guess he was nine years old. You know, mm-hmm. he shot his first bird with me. Just like you said, see the expression on his face. Then my other son, I had him out there when he was three. He was sitting in between my laps. I didn't care if I didn't get a turkey in or whatever, just to see him so he can experience it. When when he was old enough, first year I took him at 12, he shot a double beard. A double beard bird. I he I said, go get him, Kurt. He jumped out of that blind. He took off like a bat out of hell. He jumped on it, and all I hear him saying, gotcha, sucker. <laughs> and that's what he said. And I was laughing. I was tearing. It was just awesome. He was crying. It was really, really, it was a good, good hunt. It yeah. was really, uh, yeah, it was awesome. That's what it's about right there. That yeah. is the exact yeah. reason why you yeah. hunt. Yeah. yeah. It was awesome. I really enjoyed that. And just, like I said, I just love being out there, bud. I really, really do. We will be right back after this short break. Who or what is Dead Ringer? Dead Ringer hits many categories within the archery, hunting, and shooting industries. With products ranging from tactical scopes to archery broadheads, Dead Ringer has what you need. The company embodies the work hard, play harder attitude. Having passionate individuals from top to bottom that are driven to bring the best products at the best price to you, the consumer. Make sure and check them out at DeadRingerHunting.com. So here we'll uh, come to a close on the podcast. Um, One thing I like to do with all these interviews is I like to ask what would be one tip One piece of advice, if you could pick one or maybe a couple that you would pass on to youth, to new, to new hunters in, in, in the industry. What I would do for my tip for youth hunters, I would say just go out and enjoy it. Just have fun. Read as much as you can. How they say, you know, it's better to keep your mouth closed and your ears open. You know, like when you're like go to seminars, like from these guys that have been hunting for a long time, you know, the turkey seminars, the deer seminars. Gather all the information that you can, you know, to make yourself a better hunter. You know what I mean? I mean, just go out and enjoy yourself. It doesn't matter if you kill the biggest buck or the smallest buck, the biggest turkey, a jake. It doesn't matter. Just go out and have fun. That's the main thing. Having fun, spending time with your family and your friends. That's what it's all about. You know, we seem to steer away from our hunting heritage we know with through you know because all the social media and stuff what's happening you know like you said before about shooting you know it has to be the biggest buck it's not but for the youth hunters just make sure you do everything by the book you know take your classes you know and just prolong it just keep getting better and better and better practice if you like turkey hunting practice that turkey call you might sound like the horrible person in turkey in the world ever hand but it doesn't matter just keep practicing so if you don't shoot one that year, next week or the week after, you might kill one. It doesn't matter. You got to keep practicing and just have fun. Just have the camaraderie between your family and your friends. And and then when you get older, pass it on to the next generation. Because without the younger generation right now, we're all doomed. We have to have them take our place because, you know, the Lord's not going to keep us on this earth for amount of time you know so we have to have people take our place and the youth is the way to do it because if they don't do it there's not going to be any more hunting left yep and like you said i think you know the main point is to enjoy the moment you know be in the moment and take it in and 
like I said before, and I'll say it again, not harvesting something doesn't mean it's a failure. Just no. being out there is what yep. you got to understand and what you got to, you got to learn from every experience because you can learn something from every experience. Let it be good, bad, or indifferent, but you can learn something. And you learn by your mistakes, just like anything else. That's you know, even like when you're at work, you know, you do the same thing. You screw up something, something happens. Okay, I can fix this problem. You know what I mean? You just learn by your mistakes, and you just get better and better and better at it. You got to so, yeah. have that positive attitude yep. when the good and the bad happen. That's the main thing. Just have that positive attitude, and I'm telling you, you will excel. And, and that's what I believe in. Well, I want to say thank you again, sir. I really appreciate you taking the time sitting here talking to me. Um, we'll definitely have to do it again. You're very welcome, Kenzie. It's my pleasure, and thank you for being a valuable pro staff member. You do very, very good. I watch all these guys, what they do on social media, and I tell you, I have a great team. I really, really do. My managers are phenomenal. My bosses are phenomenal. Just the whole company in itself is. Those guys are awesome. They really, really are. And I'm glad to be part of Dead Ringer. To end, what is, uh, what, how can they find Dead Ringer? What's the best way to get in, talk, in contact with you? Well, it's very simple. If I usually post on social media, mostly on Facebook. If you would like to join the pro staff, just like you did, you know, you go through social media. I usually post everything up. Like you go to uh, www.deadringerhunting.com. You go to, uh, it says pro staff or about us. You click on that. You fill out the application. The application comes to me. I review it. I send it out to my managers and then my managers will disperse it to you. And then you send me your pro staff order. Form. I take care of it right then and there. You can go to our page, Facebook, Dead Ring of Hunting. Give us a like. Give us a share. We do two uh, on Tuesdays. We're back by popular demand. <laughs> where we have uh, tips for Tuesdays, and I got elected. I don't know if you've seen it or not. That we are we're giving a lot of prizes away. No, I've seen that. So, yeah, but well, I just did one this past weekend. So tomorrow, you know, every Tuesday. Chime in, like, share, and comment on Facebook, and you can win some cool prizes. For sure, neat. for sure. That's it. Well, again, I appreciate it, and I'll be talking to you, sir. Oh, you're welcome, buddy. Thank you very much for having me. Can't say thank you enough to Eddie for taking the time to sit down with me and just talk a little hunting and Dead Ringer. Make sure and head over to deadringerhunting.com and check out what they have to offer. Don't forget that a trophy means just a little bit different to each one of us. Let's do our best to push each other and lift each other up with each animal that we harvest. This podcast was brought to you by Big Muddy Outdoors. Make sure and like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next week.